just by a quick way of introduction for those of you who don't know me, as, as Dr. Olson said, I, I had a fairly lengthy career in law enforcement, uh, the latter half of which was primarily involved in white collar crime, fraud, and public corruption. So I dealt with a lot of paper, a lot of documents. I can remember one of my last uh, cases out in Washington, D.C. We had over 500 bankers' boxes of just paper documents to go through. So uh, I've learned a little bit about going through documents and papers. And, and although I'm not a scientist, I did work in the field of forensics, which obviously is what crime is all about. So I'm hoping that I can bring that to bear on the subject that I want to talk about tonight. Since I retired, I've had an interest in archaeology and anthropology, especially as it pertains to the Bible. So I'll be right up front. That is my worldview. Uh, and I look at that, I hope, with an open mind so that I can try to reinforce what I believe. And if it's not true, to look at what else might be out there. When it comes to the area of dinosaurs, I got a little bit interested in, in that, actually quite interested, probably well over 10 years ago now when my oldest grandson, who I appreciate being here tonight, before he ever started school, he loved dinosaurs, and he could tell you the names of all of the dinosaur, dinosaurs and even pronounce them correctly. I was like, what is this all about? But he made a comment to me that really stuck with me, and he said, well, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago before people did. And I didn't believe that, and I knew that was being taught in school, but I couldn't figure out how he got that. He wasn't even in school yet. So I started looking at what's being taught, and what, what really is the deal with dinosaurs? Since I've retired, God has blessed me with the opportunities to travel, which I love, so it works out good. And I've been around the world a few times. Uh, everywhere I go now, in the last few years, I've started to focus in on dragons, because I find dragons everywhere I go. What is this with dragons? What, what are they? Well, we're going to talk about them a little bit tonight. Now, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to try to get into some historical issues with it. I, I enabled, uh, named this mythtory, kind of as a play on words, if you will, between myth and history, because they are actually kind of combined, as we'll see. But as I'm looking at this picture, it's like, well, let me get this straight. So you're not going to be able to see my green light here. And it's a red light. This is not true. This is just some artist who has drawn ostensibly a creature that people say that they have seen. This is real. This is a fossilized Tyrannosaurus rex by the name of Sue. And if you go to Chicago, you can see this wonderful creature in the Chicago Field Museum. Kind of cool, isn't it? But now, as I look at this, and I realize that, you know, obviously it's not exact, but do you see any similarities to this, or am I, am I really crazy? Do they look maybe even a little bit familiar? I, I kind of see this, so it's like, well, let me kind of explore this a little bit further and see where we're going. So I, I had to, I had, as an investigator, I have to come up with a hypothesis. What am I looking at? Why am I looking at it? What, what, where am I coming from? And this is what I am coming from. I believe the dragons really existed sometime in the past. And I believe that they existed with people. And those people wrote about these encounters that they had with them. Sometimes they drew art, sometimes they drew um, rocks. Sometimes they made sculptures of things that they thought that they had seen. Now, there are, there are a lot of reasons why people would say that, well, they didn't really see them. They, maybe they dug up a dinosaur bone and imagined these things, but it's, we'll see how consistent those are. If that's the case, then my hypothesis is that dragons, if they really existed, are most likely what we today would call dinosaurs. And we have to keep in mind that dinosaurs, by dictionary definition, you can see down here, were basically just large reptiles. And a lot of times people get involved in all the classification and all the number of definitions that go with dinosaurs, but very simply that's what it is. They're just a large reptile. Oftentimes they'll say extinct or fossil. That's what a dinosaur is, and they're very large. And by the way, they are reptiles, so I'll, I'll throw this out to most of you probably already know this, but what is interesting about a reptile in terms of its growth? As long as they're alive, they continue to grow, unlike us. So if we actually had a really neat world where people really did live long periods of time and animals as well didn't die, some of these creatures would get to be pretty big. And of course, secondly, we know that the word, and I'm sure most of, most of you already know this, that the word dinosaur didn't even exist 150 years ago when Sir Richard Owen named it some, from some of the fossils that he'd seen. So anything that was seen before then wouldn't have been called a dinosaur anyway. There were a number of different creatures that people had uh, 
names for these creatures that they saw. Dragon wasn't the only one. There were a number of them. But we've come to know and love them as dragons. But when we start looking at these, you ask the question, then what is a dragon? If you look at Webster's right now, they'll tell you that it really a long time ago we said that it was a, a huge serpent, but today we don't believe that anymore. It's mythical. But what they mean by mythical is it didn't really exist. And they gave a little bit of a, a, of a definition of what that was. But interestingly enough, in the World Work Encyclopedia, they said something that I found very interesting. Dragons of legend are actually strange like creatures that really lived in the past. It's almost as if they were trying to say maybe di dinosaurs and dragons were the same thing, but they couldn't quite bring themselves to say that. And of course, they added that every country has them. And everywhere I've been, I found some sort of a dragon story. Uh, so they, they wanted to say it, but they really couldn't quite bring themselves to do that yet. And that's what we're going to kind of explore a little bit, too. And, and I'm going to start off with the story that that reminds me of, because one of my heroes in life is Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And Sherlock Holmes went on a camping trip with Dr. Watson a while back. And they spent the night roasting marshmallows and hot dogs. They had a grand old time until the wee hours of the night. It got dark, and they finally went to bed and to sleep. In the middle of the night, Holmes woke up, and he nudged Watson. And he said, Watson, wake up. What do you see? Watson looked up at him. He says, I see millions and millions of stars. Holmes said, and what does that tell you, Watson? Now, Watson's always being tested by Holmes, right? So he says, well, astrologically, that tells me that Jupiter is in Leo. Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions and millions of, there must be millions and millions of galaxies. Orologically, it tells me that I can deduce that the time is about 3.15 in the morning. <laughs> Meteorologically, it tells me that we're going to have a beautiful sunny day tomorrow. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are small and insignificant. Being pretty proud of himself, he turned to Watson and he said, what does that tell you, Holmes? Sherlock shook his head, looked over at Watson and said, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> So that's my challenge for you tonight. Don't lose sight of the tent as we look at this to see behind all of the other facade of what may be out there. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary also has a really neat uh, definition of it. I'm going to throw up some of this. Once again, it's all mythical. But they did distinguish between European and Western dragons and Eastern dragons. And I find that interesting. I'm not sure I have the real answer for that. We'll talk about it a little bit. But I happen to have in my house a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary from 1940. That's not that long ago. I know for some of you guys here, that's a long time ago. But it really isn't. And this is what, in 1940, we defined in a dictionary as a dinosaur. It didn't say they were mythical. It said it's actually a human serpent. So people obviously did believe that, and even as recent as that. But when we look at this, we, we need to kind of understand that, you know, dinosaurs have at least seven to 800 genera of different kinds or types. Well, I don't like to talk about species and order class and biological, these sorts of things. They get a little confusing, but the, the kinds. Well, dragons are the same way. I mean, we picture a lot of dragons that we see up here, but there are actually many more than these, but probably the primary types of dragons that we see would be the general dragon. We talk about the fire-breathing dragon that was in the first slide that you saw. That's what we kind of think of, winged, perhaps monstrous type thing, but there are actual names of dinosaurs that have been used throughout most of history. Probably the first one would be griffin, gargoyle, cockatrice, basilisk, and sea monsters. And this is just kind of a hodgepodge of photographs that we'll just briefly talk about what some of these are. The first one we should talk about is the griffin, because the griffin is obviously often called the king of all these types of things because he was so big. Sometimes the sculptures and art doesn't do him justice, but he had the head of an eagle, and he had the body of a lion. Of course, the eagle is the king of birds, and the lion is the king of beasts. So he was very important to people. And they had him around for a long time. This, uh, <coughs> this little jobby right here came out of eastern Persia. And it stayed at about 5,000 years old. And this particular one here uh, came out of Greece, and it's uh, dated to about 7,000 years old, according to the dating techniques. But this is what a, a scientific at that time, naturalistic science book described as a griffin. 
in the Harley bestiary in, in England. And you can see the difference there with this head of a bird and the lion type body, and you can even see the, the animal type of claws in the front. If you notice closely, that's a bird's uh, front claws. And he has some sort of large beast in his uh, control that he's probably about to devour because it's said that griffins really like to eat horses, but they would eat cows and other large animals as well. So he must have had a ferocious appetite. He doesn't really look all that ferocious in that picture, but uh, he was certainly considered that way by the people who encountered him. The next one is the gargoyle, and that's kind of an interesting one because we see them a lot, even in our buildings today. I was trying to look to see if there was one in Minneapolis, and I didn't get a chance to see that. But if you travel anywhere, you're going to see big buildings. They're going to have one of these types of things <coughs> in the building, aren't they? And by the way, you know, there's a word that really sounds interesting with that. It's called gargoyle. <laughs> it comes from the same word of gargoyle because they put them up there for drain systems, but they're the, the story is, is that there was an actual dinosaur creature that lived in the same river in ruined France, and it was plaguing the people, even killed a few people, wreaking havoc with shipping, etc. Until finally, we had a, a saint named uh, Romanus who killed it. And he saved the day, and he burned the body, but they cut the head off, and they stuck the head up on the top of the church to scare away other spirits, etc. And the gargoyle has stuck ever since, and now we find it in the everywhere. The other one that's a little bit different, some of you may not have heard of this one, is the cockatrice. Now, there are a lot of pictures of cockatrice that don't look so foreboding, so I purposely chose that one. I'll, I'll acknowledge that here from a castle in Croatia, because that one, I think, looks pretty ferocious. Uh, they are obviously wing-type creatures. One of the things about the cockatrice is said that they were venomous and that they could stun and or kill people just by staring at them in their eyes. They had a, a way of charming that sort of an aspect of the pockets. And finally, the basket. Now, he doesn't look so awfully interesting to me at first either. This is uh, the top picture is a drawing of a, again, scientific book from the German Anastasius Kircher in 1669. Types of drawing, made woodcuts, etc., of a creature that had been reported in the 1600s. But, I just had to put the one down below here, too, to point out, doesn't that look fairly similar? You see the crown on the head, the, the tail isn't so much curled. But now the way they do the four feet's interesting, but it's the same type of concept with scale, scale. So this is an angle sort. Some of the physical attributes that were often given to dragons, these clearly aren't all of them. Like I said, they're, they're so different, they're all over the place from small snakes. And in Germany, they called them worms, worms. Uh, because they were more serpentine. But these are some of the things. Now, you notice that I highlighted fire breathing because that always gets the attention of scientists. Think that can't possibly happen. And we know about the vomiter beetle and other types of animals, but I want you to consider this for just a minute. This also comes from the Field Museum in Chicago. Anybody know what that is? Lamb shark? Dinosaur. Lamb shark? <laughs> but look at that head. Isn't that kind of cool? This is in the Field Museum of Chicago. And this happens to be the fossilized skeleton of a, if I can pronounce it right, a Herosaur Ophilus. It is known to have the longest nasal chamber of any of them. Nobody really knows what that did. It's been theorized that maybe it was used to make sound. But it did have a throat, so it didn't need to have that as a sound. It, it may have. But it also could be used, because it's a hollow chamber, to have something expelled from it. I, I don't know. I'm just saying it's something to consider. So now we need to talk a little bit about some definitions as we begin our investigation. What is a myth? Well, by definition, a myth is basically something that's based on a historical fact, but it's not true. It's a story that someone has made up based on something historical, at least initial, but it's not true. Some of the synonyms that go with this you've probably heard quite a bit, and the one that usually would be attached is fairy tale, once upon a time. And when you hear that, we typically know that that's probably not a true story. And I hate to say that, but if someone says that, it's probably not true. But what is history? <laughs> history is the study of the past, usually with written records. Now, for the purposes of my investigation tonight, I'm going to go a little bit beyond what would normally be called written because 
uh, as I study anthropology, I, I come to understand, I won't go into this, that all of the civilizations in the world started at about the same time, right around 4,000 BC. You know, whether it's the Mesopotamian ones, whether it's the Mesoamerican ones, whether it's the Chinese, they all started at about the same time for civilizations. So they made drawings and they made rock art and other types of images, if you will, of some of the things that they saw. So I'm going to include that in my investigation. One thing I do want to point out, though, is I'm trying to be as, as impartial as I can. Whatever I found on a creation science website, I did not use unless I could verify it with at least one and preferably more secular references. So I'm trying to, to at least bring that up to other people to bring it to us. And what we're going to cover tonight is just a dot of all the information that's out there. We could spend weeks talking about the actual historical data. There are books that have been written on it. As I started looking at these books, I realized that you can't even compile all of them into a compendium that would you know, anybody could read in their lifetime. There's too much information there. The earliest history I am going to suggest is the Bible. Now, I know that that's going to be controversial, and this is not the form in which I'm going to discuss that, but the reason that I'm listing the Bible as the earliest historical record of dragons, even though for most accounts it was written by Moses, or at least in the first five books of the Old Testament, the earliest ones around 1400 BC, and there are other written documents that are out there that may precede it, but as we're going to talk about some of the myths, this is clearly an historical record. And when people talk about that, you need to understand the context in which things are spoken. The Genesis account in the Bible that we read is, in fact, historical narrative. Some of the Psalms and other books in the Bible are clearly poetic and meant to be allegorical, sometimes metaphorical, simile, etc., but not Genesis. So when we read that account, it is, in fact, the earliest written record that I can find in my mind that refers to dragons. And when you look at that, uh, again, I'm not going to go into this because many of you probably know that, but the Hebrew has somewhere between no more than 80,000 words, 45 to 80,000 words, whereas the English language has what, upwards of a million words, like 800,000 to a million words. So you have to try to figure out when they use the word, what did they mean? And a lot of confusion by scholars exists on this too, because the word that's typically translated as dragon in the Hebrew Bible is the word tan. Anytime you pluralize a word in Hebrew, you add an I am to the end of it, so tanadim would be dragons. But there's another word up there, tanim, that comes up as well. Tanim because tanim, because that's usually translated as jackal. In most of the modern Bibles that you're going to have out today, you will find the word jackal instead of dragon. Most of the King James Bibles, until Mr. Schofield came around, still called them dragons. What I found interesting, though, is if you do a little investigating, you go back, You'll discover, does anybody know the Bible that was most prevalent when Jesus walked the earth? Septuagint. Very good. It was the Septuagint. And it was written in what language? Koine. Koine. Greek. 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 I can't read Greek, but I know the alphabet, so I looked up the Septuagint. It uses the word drag, the Greek word drag. And then the next Bible that came along was Jerome's Vulgate. It was written in... Latin, and in the Latin, he also used the word dragon. So clearly, a couple thousand years ago, when people saw that word, they equated it with dragon. People that weren't of the Hebrew the language ilk. Oh, I just wanted to point out, I think we saw the word whale in the Genesis account on the fifth day when the fish were created. The word tannin that would be dragon was translated by King James as whale. There are other creatures in the Bible, though, and I'm sure most of you know about these two. Behemoth the and Leviathan come up quite a bit, uh, especially in Job. Leviathan is mentioned in other books to include Isaiah. Behemoth is a land animal, and he's monstrous, and Job tells us that God said that he's the chief of all the creation that he made, the largest, with his huge tail. So we know about Behemoth, and Leviathan was a, actually a fire-breathing sea animal, lived in the sea. And he's mentioned in a lot of different things. He's got these scales and maybe crocodilian, who knows, but the scales were so tight they couldn't even put a spear in through it. But these are mentioned uh, throughout the Bible, so we know that those are other animals that the historical record talks about. There's a couple others, though. You remember we talked about cockatrices. Did you know that the word cockatrice is in the Bible? And it's used by this, the Hebrew word sapa, and in that particular time, it is used five times in the Bible. And all but one is 
translated as Pachyprus, the other time as, as, as an ass for an adder. The other one, Basilisk, that we talked about, is also found in the Bible, but only one Bible that I could find, and that's the Dewey Rains Bible back in 1582. That Bible's no longer in production, but it translated the word heaven as basilisk. Other places today that heaven would be translated as serpent, adder, or asp. So now we're going to talk quickly about some of the myths that a lot of these things are based on before we actually get into the history. Some of them may have a profound effect on the actual history. One of the earliest myths comes from Sumeria. It gets a little bit difficult, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you have the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Hittites, all the, and most of them kind of blend together. But one of the more interesting stories that comes out of all that is there were a couple gods by different names, and we'll use the one Apsu and Tiamat. Tiamat was the female goddess of all of the seawater, salt water. Apsu was the god of all the fresh water. And they had children, and they finally had a grandson named Ea. And Ea was handsome and brave and became the head of all of the gods. But he didn't like some of the things that uh, Apsu said, because Apsu didn't like this young upstart being loud and boisterous. And he actually plotted to kill Ea. And Ea found out about it, and he killed Apsu. Well, Apsu, uh, now he's dead. Tiamat finds out about that. And by the way, Tiamat, even before then, this is sometimes described as a dragon. She is classified as the mother of all dragons in that ancient Mesopotamian culture. She gets mad, so she comes after Ea to fight him. Well, Ea gets scared, believe it or not, and he en enlists his son, a man named Marduk, who we'll hear about later, and Marduk takes on the challenge. Now, he's going to get to be the greatest god by doing this, and he's fighting with Tiamat. She's about to devour him with his mouth, but he calls upon the east wind that was at his beck, and it breathes down her throat. She can't close her mouth. He shoots an arrow down and kills her. And when she's dead, they split her body in half. Part of it goes up to make the stars, and, well, the moon and some of it, celestial bodies. The other half goes to make the earth, covering the, the water of Apsu. But of course, her eyes get the tears formed of the river Tigris and Euphrates. Now we go into Greek mythology. The father of the god Jericho is Zeus, and this is an ancient pottery drawing from about five It shows him fighting the Hydra Typhon. And it's kind of an interesting little specter. We don't see a lot. You can see the wings and the serpentine type body, but it looks more like a human at the top. But his son, Hercules or Heracles, depending on whether you're Roman or Greek, uh, was given, well, actually, in Delphi, Greece, he was given the 12, from the oracle, the 12 commands of the things, the verbs that he had to do, and one of them was to kill Hydra. And this is a, hopefully, Lord willing, by the end of this month, we're going to be in Vienna where we can see this at the Hofburg Palace the sculpture of him killing the nine-headed hydra. In other accounts, it's a seven-headed hydra. Egyptian mythology is abundant with dragons. Somewhat like the Greek, though, more serpentine than the European type of dragon that we think of fire-breathing, etc. But they had uh, Apip or Apophysis was their serpent dragon. And every night, as the sun would go down, this serpent would come up to swallow the sun. And Seth or Ra, depending on where you're at in Egyptology at that particular point in time, were there to kill that dragon so that it wouldn't swallow up the sun and it could come up the next morning. <laughs> oh, the Norsemen. We've got a lot of Norsemen here, hey? <laughs> Josh, where are you about? Check. Anybody know who that is? <laughs> who is that? <laughs> Thor. Very good. <laughs> now, this is a tough one. Do you know who that is? The Urban Tongue of the World Service. Very good. You can pronounce it in Norman Guard. Sigar, the Midgard Serpent. Thor, of course, was the son of the Almighty God Odin. And Odin had cast Jormungand down to the earth to the sea, to, to go under the sea with his tail in, his, in her mouth, circling around and around and around. Well, eventually, Thor got into a fight and killed Jormungand. But unfortunately, she breathed her fire on him and he died in the in the Battle of Fall the Beach. There are actually a couple of runa stones in Sweden that, Sweden's a, a pretty neat place for a lot of this too, that show, I think these are kind of cool. This one shows Thor and his buddy Heimer, and they're fishing for Jormungan. They catch him, but Heimer kind of chickens out, so they don't do anything with him. He cuts the line and lets him go. But years later, Thor encounters him on the beach. This is another picture showing Thor with his hammer getting ready to In India, we have the Indus mythology of Indra and Varita. 
Now, the dragon <coughs> and the god are sometimes mixed up. Sometimes one is good, the other is bad, and sometimes one is good and the other one's bad. The issue here, though, is Veritra, as a lot of dragons do, they're associated with water in Eastern cultures, stored up all the water. So we didn't have any rivers coming, water coming into Ganges. And so they had to do something about it, and Indra took it on himself to kill Veritra, and thereby free the waters. The Chinese mythology, again, is very interesting. It's, even though, as we mentioned before, typically their dragon is more beneficent, more friendly, more peaceful, they did have some bad dragons, and they had to have some emperors kill them. But it was considered really good luck to be around a dragon. In fact, the emperors, a lot of the Chinese people in the early days thought that they actually came from dragons. And the emperors wanted to say that they were the, the product. They were the product of dragons. They, Allegedly, and we'll see this later again, but even as far back in mythology, they kept dragons. They had dragon feeders. They had dragons pulling their chariots. They used dragon parts for medicine. So they really thought that dragons were very, very important. And again, they, they appreciated the dragon more so than they did in European cultures. This is a tomb with a human skull in it, or a skull, skeleton. It's dated to about 5,000 years ago in the Yangqiao dynasty. What's interesting about it is this was obviously some, whoops, what down here? I the button. It, it may not be as clear as uh, when I exploded the picture, but this is clearly, and it's, and it's, and it's been identified as a, as a uh, tiger. This is a dragon. You can kind of see the mouth opening up here, the legs, and the tail. So they thought, and these are made out of shells, not actual anything other than that. But they certainly made a representation over 5,000 years ago in their burial processes. And of course, I think most of you are familiar with this, is that the Chinese zodiac has the 12 creatures on it. And this dates back to 2,637 BC. So we're talking almost 5,000. The, the dragon on it. They have the serpent, but they got a dragon too. All of the other 11 animals are real animals. Why would they throw in a fake animal with all the real animals? And I have to throw this one because this is called the Dragon Wheel Bowl. It has been authenticated to about 1800 BC. You can buy this on eBay for $118,000 today. It's out there. What I find interesting about it though is This is a harnessor. It's a duck-billed dinosaur. You can see the little horns on the top of the head, the scales. So they knew about that well before anybody even found the harnessor fossils to begin with, let alone what they imagined would be on it. How'd they do that? Now we go to South America. In the Amazon, there's this big creature called Yucamama. Yucamama likes to eat people. You can see here, he's got the crown, feather type head, long serpentine body. Supposedly well over 150 feet in length, and what Yakamanda, Yakamama would do is swallow up water and he would blow it on his victim to stun him and knock him out before he ate him. And of course, this was, I always, I always try this, I, I do know a little Spanish, but Quetzalcoatl is the Aztec feathered serpent god. This is in Teotihuacan, Mexico, in central Mexico. That's their, his temple. And you can see here, it's adorned with all these little heads coming down. And when you get a close-up of it, you can see that it is a dragon serpent type creature. And you can even tell that it's got the feather type things around his head that would represent the feather serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. I much prefer the Mayan because I can pronounce Kukulkan a lot better. <laughs> it comes a little bit later down. It's only about a thousand years old. But this, this may, uh, has anyone been to Chichen Itza? You. Has anybody climbed that? <laughs> Wasn't that fun? I, I, did, I had to come down like a ladder. This doesn't give it justice, but this is extremely steep with small steps. So you back down and you go down and say, like, oh my goodness, this is pretty steep. And I was even young back then. <laughs> but on the end of it, you can see again the, the big serpent there. Now, I have to throw in some. Now, these, these are not going to be really. But a few years ago, we had the privilege of traveling around South America, and we were in the country of Chile. 
There's a little city there called La Serena. La Serena is north of uh, Santiago before you get to the Peruvian border. But what I was impressed with in South America is everywhere you go, they have little archaeological museums and stuff. It's all over. You know, quite a little bitty town, there's a museum, they got neat stuff in it. And I found these, these creatures here. I don't know if you can make it out here well enough. This is some sort of a creature. It is not a turtle. You can see these protrusions coming out. These are not what you would typically call theirs. None of these are identified in these museums, by the way. They're just there. So I don't know what they are, but I, I found them to be kind of interesting with the, the legs and stuff, and they're prolific. Uh, and another one here that would show, this one doesn't come up very well later, you can see this huge head. And I don't know if you can tell these horn type things coming out here, but again, these things usually represent some sort of scales. So you know, this isn't a cow. You can see the, the feet coming down here. To make it more interesting, well, the town of La Serena was actually founded by the Spaniards, and King Charles I made this its coat of arms in the 1500s. A little further north in the town of Lima is a very famous uh, museum that's called the Hilaro Larco Museum. It's really a neat museum if you get a chance to go to it. Got all kinds of neat stuff in it. Most of these are behind glass. You, you walk down rows of glass enclosed shelves, so it's really difficult to take pictures. But this is one that I kind of like. This was rather typical. You see a lot of this in that area, especially in the Inca type of culture, where it looks like some sort of a dragon with a teeth. I don't know if this is supposed to be a feather or a horn or whatever, but it's certainly serpentine. And usually if you get to the other side, you'll see legs as well. But I had to take a picture of this one, whatever in the world it was, it wasn't. Because this is obviously some sort of weird creature with those toes, followed by a man with his iPad. <laughs> <laughs> According to everything you can see. Now, we're kind of still in that area of history, but this will be the last kind of myth history that we get to. And this is the epic of Gilgamesh. And I'm not going to focus on a lot of it. Many of you know the story of Gilgamesh and, and the flood. But it's historic from the standpoint that most people today acknowledge that Gilgamesh was probably a real person. He was probably a king in Uruk in about, you know, right after the time of the flood, 2500, 2300 BC, thereabouts. So probably a real person. And he, on his travels, as he was going around, there's about 10 or 11 tablets of the very epic uh, of what he did as his adventures. But one of the things that he did was he slew the sometimes dragon, sometimes beast, Umbaba. Umbaba was the guardian. Remember we talked about the griffin was the guardian of treasures and stuff. Umbaba was the guardian that the gods had set up. And they didn't end up, once again, just like in some of the other stories, the gods didn't like the good Lamesh killed Umbaba either, by the way. And some sources do, do call Umbaba a dragon that actually breathed fire. The, uh, the drawing up here, by the way, this is actually from a, an Assyrian type or Babylonian seal that they would have used to stamp on things. Now we're going to get into history, and we're going to go back to a time that's about 2,500 years ago. About the time, does anybody know what that is, by the way? This, the drawing. Yes, sir. The Ishtar Gates. The Ishtar Gates. And what are the Ishtar gates? The it was one of the gates in Babylon. Ishtar, of course, was a goddess. Yeah. And it was built by King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember him from the Bible? Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, etc. And he was really proud of what he had done here. You can kind of see how this, this thing is, is like 80 feet tall. This, this is a very interesting story. A bunch of German archaeologists found this in Iraq, one day Iraq. And they disassembled it block by block, moved it to Berlin, and reassembled most of it. I'll show you some of most of it. This would be the main gate coming in, the procession way. And you can see the animals that are depicted on it here. We've got, uh, obviously, the dragon. We've got an orc in a, in, a, in a lion. They even reassembled the bricks that they had that made the procession way. You can see the people in there. And this little glass thing here, I'll show you a photograph of that that gave you a, gives a better description of how it would have looked in, uh, in Babylon in those days. The procession would be coming down here, and this is the gate that they have reassembled. This one was too big. They couldn't put it up there. But this is a close-up of a little dragon. Notice the difference in his 
his front feet and his back feet, scaled body, called the scorpion's tail, the long neck, the horn, the, the, the crown, the horn, and the, the viper's mouth. We get a close up of that as well. And Marduk, the chief god of Babylon at that time, that the Ezra would have gone to, uh, had his favorite dragon who was named Mushusu. So this is Mushusu. And that's a close up of his head. It's pretty realistic, too, doesn't it? That's kind of neat. Think how they built that uh, 2,500 years ago. And again, you can see all of the fine details in this magnificent creature. And I have to throw this one in because this is along the side of that wall. Does anybody remember the story in the book of Daniel in the Bible, chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar is actually talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar is talking about how he walked around the walls of his city and he looked down and saw how wonderful it was and says, isn't this magnificent what I have done by my own might and for my own glory? And the Bible tells us that God struck him crazy for a lengthy period of time. That's what this inscription says, basically. Now, I don't read that ancient script, but it basically says, I am Nebuchadnezzar, I did this, I'm a wonderful person. I meet. <laughs> this is probably the, where we really get into the history, though, because this guy, if you don't recognize him, is typically called the father of modern history, Herodotus. And he traveled all over the world, the known world at that time, for sure. And he saw a lot of things. And this is not his only description of what we might call a dragon, but I throw this one up there. It's one that's typically referred to in most of the sources that I found. And in this, he's talking about someplace in northern Arabia called Buku where he saw this, he said, there's so many remains there, he couldn't even describe how many of these serpentine uh, spines and bones, if you will, that he saw. And most of us know, so Herodotus was about, in the fifth century BC, Alexander the Great came along in 330, did his conquering all the way over into India, and we have this record that was, that was brought back with him, and he actually saw dragons in caves that the king of India would and so many places in the East, they did not, they, they warned Alexander, don't harm our dragons. So they really never got to see the whole dragon. He just poked his head out, and they could see part of it. But they estimated from the stories they heard that it could have been as much as 200 feet long. Was it last week that they found the, the Titanosaurus in Chile, the, now the largest one that's a little over 200 feet long? They just discovered the fossilized remains of that dinosaur. They're finding a lot of them down in South America, the southern part of these humongous things. And isn't it interesting? That we, where we find these is typically in mostly unpopulated areas, more remote areas, where they wouldn't be hunted down and killed, perhaps. I like this guy. Called him Livy. He was a Roman historian, wrote, wrote a magnificent uh, history about the Roman times and Roman people. And he was, of course, he was alive around the time of Jesus. And he wrote about all these neat things, but he writes a particular account of something that happened with a Roman general named Regulus in northern Africa. While he was there, he says, this is what happened. They, had a, they were attacked by a dragon. And by the way, I found at least six other references of Roman armies encountering dragons throughout their uh, country and world. So this is simply not the only one. There are many of them. They, they finally killed him with their engine. Uh, the military engine, did everybody know what that is? Catapult? A catapult or a battery. And most of us are familiar with Josephus. Of course, uh, he was alive at the time when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, and there's a lot, a lot of history going on. But he became known as a, as a great destroyer as well, wrote the antiquity of the, the Jews and the Jewish wars, and is considered to be a pretty accurate historian. And he's talking about Moses. He talks a lot about the Old Testament. He had taken it upon himself to study that and know a lot about it. And as he's doing that, he talks about these serpents. Multitude of them. This, of course, would have been somewhere in that Arabian area as Moses was traveling through, whether it's Sinai or actually in Saudi Arabia, in that particular area. And he talks about how these particular dragons would actually ascend out of the ground or fly in the air. And that kind of meets some of the description of the serpents that we read in the Bible uh, in Exodus that Moses talks about. Maybe not completely, but, but at least somewhat, somewhat close. Pliny the Elder is another one of my favorites. He was really, he was a naturalist, he was a historian, he was really a friend of the Emperor Vespasian. 
So he had access to all sorts of different things. And he also roamed all over the earth and took note of things that he saw. He made a comment that India produces the largest elephants and dragons and other types of creatures. And even though the dragon as we know it doesn't really fit into a lot of the ancient Hindu uh, mythology, we have many writers talking about the bigger dragons coming out of India. And it was big enough that it could fold the elephants completely. I find that absolutely fascinating. But what's interesting is Pliny is, I remember Pliny because I remember reading the textbooks when I was looking at volcanoes. Unfortunately for him, in the year 8079, he was traveling through the Straits of Messina, headed up into the Adriatic Sea, and he saw an explosion, Mount Vesuvius. And his scientific curiosity got the best of him. He got into a little boat, and he started rowing over towards the volcano, and the volcanic cloud came down or something. And that's how he met his demise. But he wrote a 37 volume natural history describing different animals and things that, uh, that he had seen and encountered in his many travels. He actually talks about a dragon that was killed in Rome on Vatican Hill. And this would have been after Jesus, of course, had died, but it's still in the Apostolic Times. He also gave great descriptions about how you could use dinosaur, dragon parts for medicinal purposes and even recipes to eat. You could use the dried eyes for a salve. You could use the fat of a heart. How would he know these types of things? This guy's kind of famous. A lot of people put him off as somewhat of a myth, and I should have got another photograph of him, but I encountered St. George on my first trip to Israel, we made it up into Jordan. And if you're familiar with the whole city of Madaba, where there's the Madaba map, one of the earliest maps that we have of the whole land area. But on the wall of this church, where the, the, the uh, mosaic floor of this map is, there is a sculpture of St. George killing the dragon. So I've looked for St. George wherever I go, and I found him everywhere I go. In different ways, he looks different, the dragon looks different, but he's all over. Even in some Asian places, typically in Christian churches, not in the Buddhist or Hindu temples, of course, but, but you do see there, he's, he's all over the place. He's just, he just had it. But what we do know about him is that he was real. He was a Roman soldier, and by all accounts, he was from Armenia. The story of him comes that he was actually uh, in modern-day Turkey in a place called Libya, the town of Sardinia. And he just happened to stumble across a place where a dragon was wreaking havoc. And in order to appease the dragon, the people had decided that they would send a young maiden out to be eaten by the dragon, which always works, you know. So, <laughs> so fortunately, the lot fell on the king's eye. But fortunately for her, St. George was riding by on his horse, and I'm always a white horse. Well, most always be a white horse. And he sees the dragon and he spears it, but he hasn't quite killed him yet. And the story goes that he tied it up with his girl, took it into the town, preached to them, and they were all converted to Christianity, and then he slew the dragon. And he's mentioned prominently, King Richard the Lionheart is supposedly tells that he had a vision of St. George when he was on his crusades, and as you know, he took the dragon back then to be a symbol of England. And we see St. George prolifically all over in England today. This is just one of many drawings that we have. This one was done by the Italian cello back in the 1300s a different type of dragon. And this one is probably the most famous one by Raphael in 1506. You can kind of, it's kind of dark, but you can kind of see the wings coming up in this serpentine tail of the slave. So we do know that he was a real person. Uh, is it possible that the story was embellished? Well, like all of us, of course. But uh, it is interesting to know that, that he was real. And then we come to the epic of, I even like to say it, don't you? Beowulf. <laughs> it sounds cool. Beowulf. Beowulf had the strength of 30 men. Can you believe that? He was a strong guy. He was stronger than my son. Good <laughs> guy, strong. He got a reputation early on as a teenager of killing sea dragons. You know, the, the Norwegians knew about sea dragons well before him. And uh, the story of him is that initially he fought a dragon named Grendel, which was probably a baby, and then he killed Grendel's mother. And then as he got later, later in life, uh, he was, I believe it says he was 88. He fought a flying dragon, and 
when the flying dragon bit him and he subsequently died. He and his friend Wiglaf uh, slew that flying dragon. And just so, I had to draw this out because almost everything about Beowulf, his literature itself, the, the original story is in London. But he was a Norwegian. This is a map. The Angles came from that whole area of what we now would be part of uh, Scandinavia, the Angles down there. And he actually came up from the Swedes and was down through this entire area. But what I find interesting is, again, he's real. Archaeologists have discovered the grave sites, the grave mounds of his father and his brother. And they're dated to exactly the same dates. And they even found his grave. They only identified that some 65 years ago. And again, these are in, in, uh, in Sweden. Here is one of many photographs of Beowulf slaying Grendel. There, there are some problems with this, though, because if you're familiar with the story, does anyone know how Beowulf killed Grendel? Yes? He ripped his arm off? He ripped his arm off. What did that mean? Well, you have to shrink the dirty eyes so you can do it. But, but look at that. And it's got claws on it. The story is, is that he did that because this was a huge monster that had big jaws and sharp teeth, just like this, and he went up and grabbed it around the neck, hugged into it close so that it couldn't bite him. And then, with his strength, he pulled off one of the arms and it bled to death. Well, that's yeah, maybe okay. I have a little bit of a problem with that. But then, if you look at it, that's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I'm looking at these, and I'm thinking, <laughs> Or so we had the, the privilege of visiting this really neat city, Krakow, Poland, which is another one of our famous stories. This is the walkway up to the, to the uh, Krakow Castle, the Babel Castle. And remember, we're now in Eastern Europe, so all the W's are pronounced as V's, and all the V's are pronounced as F's, and just like the guy that went to Hawaii and his friend, and they were arguing, is it Hawaii or Hawaii? And they didn't know, so they asked the guy on the streets, we'll ask him, he'll know, he said, how do you pronounce uh, Hawaii? And the guy said, Hawaii. I said, well, thank you. He said, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> As you go along the, the, up into the castle, you can see the castle walls here. This is the Mischilla River, the mighty Mischilla River in Poland that flows on the, all the way around this castle, uh, even today. That's the inside of the courtyard of it. It's a humongous castle place up on top of a large hill. And outside on the banks of the river, we find this wonderful statue. <coughs> Of the, of the mighty Bottle Dragon. And according to the legend, he'd come and stayed in this cave right here and started plaguing the people. Now, a very similar story happens because he started bothering the people, and in order to appease them, they would feed him sheep, two sheep a day. Well, they started running out of sheep. So, what would they resort to? Young babies. Always works, young babies. Well, finally, the lock fell on the king's daughter. And she had to go out and face the, the mighty model dragon. But fortunately for her, a young shoemaker's son, some call him Dracus, some call him Krakus, some call him other names, but in any event, he came to talk to the king's wait and I got a plan. So his plan was he took some sheep skin and he put sulfur in it, stuck it outside the cave, and sure enough, Bobble came out and sparked it up. You now that sulfur started burning him because he's a fire breathing dragon, you know, dragon, you know, so it was irritating and stuff. He went out and drank up most of the Vistula River and he exploded. <laughs> So he is no longer there. The uh, bottle still exists, the dragon still exists, the kids still play on it. As you can see there, he's a mighty statue, and he still breathes fire. <laughs> and inside the church, that's a stack of bones. They say those are the bones from Bobble the dragon. Now the scientists there tell us that these are whale bones. Hmm. I have checked, and if somebody can find out, I'd be appreciative, because I don't know, but nobody's ever tested those, to my knowledge. They, they say that they were bottles bones, but they say, no, they have way of bones, but they're there nonetheless. They are bones. Now we come along to Marco Polo as we move up on our historic timeline in the 1271 AD. He gets a lot of bad press. Today, people are saying he was a liar, a cheat, and can't believe the thing he said. They certainly did believe him at the time. And the fact is, is that he actually went to and lived in China for 17 years, and he died what he saw. 
while he was in China. And this, this is what he wrote that sometimes gives people pause for cause. And he, again, he talks about that the emperor had a dragon eater. The dragons pulled the emperor's chariot. These dragons were prolific. Some of them were these horrific creatures. In the Middle Ages, starting, starting in about 1314, we started getting a lot more interest in natural history. And people started writing more about it. Scientists, if you will, going back, as I mentioned, Sometimes even before 13, 14, 1500s, and after time period, especially, a number of these booklets called bestiaries were published around the world. Many, many, many in Great Britain. And I bring out Great Britain because we have almost innumerable accounts of dragons in Great Britain of all sorts in these and other types of documents. Uh, Bill Cooper in his book After the Flood documents 82 instances of dragon sightings in primarily southern England and Wales in less than a 200 year period of time. And we'll see some of those as we go on. Now this one looks a little bit silly because it seems to show some sort of silly creature attacking an elephant. Well, remember what we said before, that dragons actually attack elephants and they weren't even safe them. And you go in to read that and it talks about how they do it. The elephant's not safe, they tie up his feet because the elephant, if the, if the serpent would grab him, they would do it to bump into the wall. Elephants are actually very smart animals. They would bump into the wall or the rocks to knock him off. So they get his feet and, and trip him so that he would fall down and they could, they could suffocate him. And actually, you know, it's, it's an amazing story. England's first printer, now we're moving forward another hundred years, went to Italy. And he described what he actually had seen. Uh, William wrote <coughs> about these, uh, this great serpent. Look at the Look at the specificity of his account. He talks about head of greater than a cow, neck longer than a donkey, and his tail great, thick, and long. Where have we seen that? Churcher. Yes. In Carlisle Cathedral, yeah. northern England, we'll find this particular castle. Richard Bell was the bishop there in 1496, four years after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And there's a carpet there that these uh, arrows are pointing to here, and that's what's under it. In 1496. Ulysses Aldromandus. He's considered by many, including Carl Linnaeus, as being the father of natural history. He also traveled around the world. These guys were loved to travel. They had a keen curiosity about them. He actually made this woodcut carving here of an animal that he subsequently saw. And this is a later rendition of that particular animal that he describes in the account of that we'll look at later because the account says that this is what he saw, or this is what he was told. And look at, again, the specificity. When you look at an investigation, who, what, when, where, and how, and why of the it. That's what we always are trying to look at. He's got them all answered here. We've got the, the, the date and the time. we got the who, Master Patronus, and the, and the dragon, the what, he killed the dragon. Um, we got the location, again, on private farm. Is that a mile outside of Bologna? And he talks, he, the, the man was scared to death, hit him over the head and killed him. Well, what's interesting, though, is Elder Bambus, according to the stories, actually kept this creature and had it stuffed and mounted. He had what was called a cabinet of curiosities. And he had all these strange creatures that he found all over the world. And this was one of them up until probably about the 1700s when a lot of things dissipated. Much of his findings are still in the museum in Bologna. We have another guy now, another almost 100 years later, a clergyman and naturalist, Edward Topsil, who wrote a book called History of the Four Footed Beast. And I include that here because he talks about how these dragons that they see, these, these types of, of dragons, are all kinds of different types of them, not just one, many different types. They're, they're distinguished by where they come from, the numbers of them, and their size, the different types of forms that they have. Some of them have wings, some don't. Some have wings and feet, some only have wings, some only have feet. So there are all sorts of different types of dragons that have the tops all over that. At about that same time period, a book that came out true and wonderful, and it talks about actual dragon encounters in the area of Sussex, in the southern England, 
down uh, even past the Cliffs of Dover, where there were actually accounts of dragons killing people. They show that in the book, but you can see these two people there lying dead and an animal that it, that it had killed as well. Uh, and they reported that in 1614 in an area called Bernard's Green. And once again, it's specific about its size. And this is, of course, the old English. I didn't misspell these words. But with the, the colors and all these sorts of things. But I like this one too. I probably should have. They, they, he said it was shaped like an actual tree in a park. Now, doesn't that sound like some of the dinosaurs we have? Where it had the long tail, which would be one axle, the long neck on the other hand, and then the kind of rotund body, like an axle? And in Essex, a little further north, as you get up around uh, north of London, talks about dragons, and specifically a doctor in 1669 that was killed, called the Henneman Dragon. And in Switzerland, this is a natural history book. This is a drawing that was in it. Now, I know, at first blush when I first saw that, I kind of thought of this too. This looks a little bit silly, but look at this creature. You've got the kind of crown on the head, the really long neck. You can't really tell the scale type stuff, but the three toes, this is that uh, spur, not, a, not a necessarily a digit, and the long tail. And there's tons of these stories in Switzerland. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll be there we're going, uh, in a few weeks, and the name Brendel appears in Switzerland as well, as well as the story in Mount Pilatus, where a very noble man, a very respected man, saw a flying dragon coming out of a cave in Mount Pilatus, and we see him flying Right, Gary? But that is a Velocosaurus, and that looks very similar to that creature that we just saw in that Swiss natural book. The area of Wales is specifically known for flying or winged dragons. They, they were really killed a lot of people. They were really terrified. And especially this place, Pentland Castle in Morgan County. As you come up to this castle on the hill, you get a better view of all the trees. You can kind of imagine these winged things coming down, harassing and even killing people. And it talks about how frequent they were with the description of them. And it had poison of venom. Remember we said the cockatrice was the basilisk. Now, most of us here know a little bit about the Vikings. I'm talking about the real Vikings. Um, well, they, they, put, they, they really knew about dragons. They put these sea serpents on their, on their boats to scare off the monsters. We already talked about how Beowulf gained a reputation killing these sea serpents. In 1734, a missionary of Greenland, the Hans Ekman, saw something and he made a drawing of it. He was known for being a, a, a meticulous recorder of facts. Did my drawing something? So we'll have to go to this one. Uh, I forgot about that. It's a lame thing. I, he, he had a sketch of the sea serpent up there. This is from the city square in Bergen. And I don't know if anyone's been to Bergen, but right down in the middle of the city there, they have this huge Four corner statue that has a number of different things on it. I just include this one because you can clearly see something here along with all the other, you know, there obviously have the crucifixion and, and other real events going on. And all the other sides are real events too. Right in the middle of the day, uh, this huge creature attacking this skull. Even in the United States of America, we've got these types of sea serpents that have been seen, and somewhat recently. These particularly ones that I'm going to be talking about now are off the coast of New England. Sometimes it's called Cassie, Cassie up in uh, Gloucester. Uh, but what's interesting is that one of George Washington's generals saw this and recorded it and put it into a, uh, and published it. The description of the dragon, etc. And in fact, this is not the same one, but it's in, you know, in a little later down in time. The New England Historical Society reports this. This is a picture of the Ipswich. Dragon. And I like this one primarily because you can see what's going on here. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be there. Oh my goodness. Sometimes things happen when you put a presentation. What's interesting is on the monster that uh, General Washington's uh, general saw, they fired at this dragon off of Maine 70 musket balls, and it disappeared. They thought nothing about it, but it washed up on shore a few days later. And they described it with its length. It was over 70 feet. They had never seen before. 
Finally, the corpse started rotting and they threw it away. So we have no idea today. There was no, there was no scientific examination of that corpse, but it's written in the annals of history. There are other instances of that, by the way, and one I didn't throw up here, I'll just toss out now is the one in Japan that just happened within the last 20 years, where they're trying to tell us it was a shark. When you see the pictures, a, a, a Japanese freighter came across this large dead animal. It was mysterious. It looked like it had long slender bodies, maybe a plesiosaur, some other types of humongous creature. Uh, and it disappeared too, but the scientists said, no, it, it must have been a shark. But when you look at the pictures, and by the way, there was a zoologist that saw it. He said that was not a shark. Excuse me? Wasn't that in uh, National Geographic one time? One time. They got rid of that story quickly. They couldn't talk about I that. I saw it in National Geographic uh, 50 or more years ago. I don't remember what it was. A lot, of, a lot of these things are hard to find. Anymore. You really have to dig to find some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they even kept that. Yeah. Any copies of that issue? I think they might have. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to try to, I have a, they do vary those. Yeah, they do, they do. Well, even our Canadian friends or First Americans have stories about dragons. If you tell us specifically, now this is obviously just a drawing. They saw these dragons on one of their adventures. We don't know where they were. And they got together and said, we better leave these things alone. Well, one of the warriors said, no, I'm brave. And he unfortunately went down to fight it and he got killed. According to their, the their legend. But we also have them up here, too. If you want to go down into Alton, Illinois, you can see this has obviously been touched up, the piazza. And this doesn't look necessarily so ferocious, but when you read the stories of the piazza, that was a, a really mean character. The wingspan on that thing could have been 60 feet long. And it was known for coming down and snatching up the people, so they had a great fear of that animal. Somewhat like the thunder that we're more familiar with, which is probably more in tune with the Ojibwe. The Mississippian culture down south had tons of dragon stories. And I want to show this just because in 1868, Charles Gould, who was a geological surveyor, uh, actually traveled the world a lot too, and he stumbled across all of these different types of creatures. And he decided he needed to write a book about these mythical monsters. But his point in writing the book is to show that they are real. They're not mystical in that sense, they're real. And he described that there's three types of them. The ones that come out of the mountains are the largest of all, and he gives you know even the colors and all this sort of stuff about them. And then the next ones are the ones that come in the flat country. They're only different because of their color, and and they frequent the water and the mountains don't. And then you go into the marshes and fens, and you get ones that are darker. And by the way, if you read some of the scientific descriptions about the dinosaurs that are known to be in marshes, they're always a darker color because they blend in better. Hmm. Anybody know this guy? <laughs> <laughs> 1933, photograph of the famous Loch Ness monster, Nessie. Now, this photograph and many others that have been subsequently taken have been reputed. They say that they have been shown to be forgeries. I don't know about all that. Most people say that that's the case. Um, this one was taken by a physician. Does, does that make any difference, Ross? <laughs> Uh, but, but obviously this is one that's still out there, but there have been over 1,800 sightings of Nessie the Wolf, and they go back 500 to 80. They go back 1,500 years that they've been seeing this. And the other thing is, is this isn't alone. You know, we've got Champy here in New York. We've got the Ogopogo in Canada. And did you know we have one here? Peppy. Peppy, Lake Pepin Sea Dragon down in Lake Pepin, Minnesota. That orderly site. So these... Lake monsters, they are. Africa has a number of stories of them. But I want to dwell just a little bit here because I went there, took this picture of the old castle ruins overlooking Mont Ness, and I looked and looked and looked. I don't see any or see monsters there at all. This was probably about three years ago. But this guy, Ian Brenning from London, took this in September of last year. It has not been debunked yet. But this is the photograph that he claims that he took in at Lake Ness. Uh, One of, one of my favorites, Draco Rex, Dragon King, Hogwartsia. Anyone know where Hogwartsia comes from? <laughs> Hogwarts from Harry Potter. Hogwarts Castle from Harry Potter. But doesn't that look like a dragon? This was only found in 2000, now I've never seen it before, I believe, by three guys digging a formation in South Dakota. 
they found this, this, this skull in three vertebrae. And eventually it made the headlines in the National Geographic in 2007 as the big bad dinosaur. Big story about it. But it's one of those types of things that people are trying to explain. We talked about, don't forget the tent. So, Pookie Harris it considers himself as, there's a special term he uses, Avisian. He's an atheist and proud of it, but you know, that's okay. But that's, that's his worldview. Mine's a little different. He's, he thought it was necessary. He's at the uh, Children's Museum in Indianapolis. And you can see he's in storybook fashion here with us. He's going to explain to us why it's a dinosaur and not a dragon. It is because dinosaurs were real, dragons are magical creatures, or not. So dragons only exist in the stories, but we have our imagination, so they will never go extinct. I mean, you know, that's, that's cute. But it wasn't just that. Daniel Cohen wrote the book, The Greatest Monsters in the World, and he made what I thought was a pretty revealing statement. They all look like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and dragons. They're, they all look the same. But, but, can't have happened. There weren't any people on the earth, so who could remember them? Couldn't happen. We got the answer. We got the answer. Well, not yet. Not yet. No, no other one has been like that. That's, Desmond doesn't quite have it, but they mysteriously became extinct, so we don't know what these dragons are. But Carl Sagan had the answer. You remember the late Carl Sagan? Yeah. He wrote a book called Gardens of Eden, in which the reason that he wrote that book was because he was bothered about all of the dragon reports. He didn't know how to handle it. So he came up with this. The book is really quite fascinating, but actually Peter Dickinson wrote The Flight of Dragons, and I liked his summary. He could do it a lot better than I could do what he, what Sagan said is basically, yeah, these stories are there, they're consistent, but they're just like that, but they must be fossil memories. Somewhere down the line, we have a million memory that we inherited from that little amoeba way back when the dragons were there. So it's that type of memory that causes people, that, and some people, well, they found the bones. You know, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to make fun of Carl Sagan, but when you look at your grasping the straws, remember what we started with. We have all this wonderful scientific knowledge and data that's out there. Don't forget that in between there, what is the obvious? Where's the tin? What are we really looking for without getting trapped by the big members? I'm going to skip over that one for time. Just, just suffice to say, the image of Lucy is real. The skeleton, mm. <laughs> anyway. I want to look quickly at the, how we look at it from an evidentiary point of view as we apply logic to our investigation that we've been so far. When we're looking at documents, most of these historical records and forensics, there are certain things that apply. We have certain things in the federal rules of evidence that are called the best evidence rule for documents. And obviously, it goes without saying the best evidence for a document is the original. But if you don't have the original, you can use copies as long as that copy is known to, shown to be consistent with what has been taught, told, talked about, etc. So it doesn't matter that it's not the original as long as you can show that connection. And you have to look at the context. Again, as you start reading, you begin to realize when you read a story once upon a time and you start looking at the things, and you look at some of these lists of the things that are you recognize that they are written in such a way as to be a story, fable, as it will, whatever. Myths can have part of history in them, just as it said. History can have a lot of embellishment in it as well. But that's what you have to try to put out. You know, obviously, eyewitness testimony is better than hearsay evidence. So we always want to look for eyewitnesses wherever we can. So a number of these accounts that I showed you tonight were actual eyewitnesses. Now, you can dispute with them all day, but they wrote what they said they saw. And I'm telling you, I've seen one. Anybody know where we're at? In Indonesia, sailing into a port of an island called Odo. <laughs> Terrible lizard. So my observations are this. You have the reports everywhere. How do you, how do you deal with them? They're there. They are real reports. All over the world. They are consistent. These descriptions matter whether it's America, whether it's in Africa, 
whether it's in Europe, a little bit different in Asia, but still, still the same. And the reports that we read, for the most part, man, they're quite detailed. Not so much in the mythical ones, they change a lot. But in the historical records that we're reading, these are really detailed accounts. And when we look at the art and artifacts, they support the written reports as well. And they are prolific. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface of all the stuff that's out there. And on top of that, most of these writers were credible. They were scientists, they were physicians, they were educators, they were men of high reputation in their communities. These were not just simple people trying to go out for sensationalism. When you look at some of the other works that they did, they didn't do any other fantasy works. And I could find no evidence to repeat what they said. I couldn't find it. Well, one guy tried to say Marco Polo never even went to China. The reason, his reason for that, by the way, is because he never mentioned chopsticks. <laughs> so obviously, if he'd been to China, he would have mentioned the nation girls and chopsticks. And he didn't, so he didn't go to China. But I, I couldn't find it, seriously, and I, and I looked. So I, I have to come up with this. And so my conclusion is, one plus one equals two. If, in fact, you can trust history, then dragons were our people. If they are, then they would be considered one of the kinds of dinosaurs what we call it today. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, if you do accept the history, it explains a lot of things that right now are bothering a lot of people. That's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. brought some really neat stuff down here for people to look at. Um, I'll be kind of to do that. Some really, really neat stuff if you get a chance. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir? is that when I said that dragons would be like a kind of dinosaur, uh, that's too broad of a statement that I meant because you can't, put, just like the dinosaur, you can't put a dragon into one kind. We have the winged ones and non-winged ones. When you do find those types, you can put them into the various reptilian class. You have the reptile, the lizard, and the orange, the bird, like the birdie up to the lizard. Up to those. And you can do that with the dragons that we know about. The, the problem is, is being able to say this fossil actually represents the dragon that was talked about in history, not necessarily the scientific observations of the bones themselves. So to say this is in fact that one. So that's the next obstacle that we will come. Anybody else? Yes, sir. How do you explain scientists who say that any creature that large Probably uh, sounds reasonable to me that any creature that big with wings would have a difficult time getting off the ground. I would agree with that. Now, the, the issue with that is when you when the descriptions are made in the historical accounts that I researched, that was one of the first things that they mentioned. There was a, a museum in Paris that a guy went to, and he said that he saw three of these actual creatures that had been captured and stuffed, if you will, in the museum. And his number one comment was their wings don't look like they'd be big enough to fly. So perhaps they weren't always used as flying, but for movement, and maybe the embellishment part is these large dragons. You know, the pterodactyl, on the other hand, and his thin one like the Thunderbird and other creatures that we talked about, certainly could. Yes, sir. That's a very good question. Why weren't animals that size crushed by their own weight? A lot of those animals have really big bones. Have you seen a, a, a dinosaur skeleton? Some of them are pretty big. And they're kind of spread out, too. But one of the questions I kind of had, I never really figured out, is the tail. You know, some of them have them where they drag and sometimes they're straight out. Is how, do they, how do they keep that protruding out all the time? That must be like some sort of a bone or something. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Mark. Yes. 
comment that there are several animals today that have wings but don't fly. There are animals today that have wings that don't fly. And, uh, you know, some might say, well, that's part of the uh, evolutionary process where all of a sudden they don't need that anymore. Uh, you know, I don't have the answer to that, but it's kind of like some of the uh, uh, vestigial organs that we have. You know, one time you need to take your tonsils out, take your appendix out, you don't need them. Well, we know that's not true, so maybe someday we'll know. But I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry? Maybe it could have been a cooling mechanism as well. It doesn't have to be for flying. It could have been like a horse's tail. Sure. Things are cool, cool. It's cool. Yeah. It's spinal organs cool up around its brain. I mean, if that certainly could have been a possibility as well as a cooling mechanism. Yeah. Managing their... I mean, they're cold-blooded reptiles yeah. generally, but maybe they need to cool themselves off some more. Yeah. If yeah. they're in the sun, you know, they... Sure. Prior to the flood, the atmospheric pressure may have been quite a bit higher. There are the huge dragonflies. Then when they have to fly, it's true. To survive. I don't know if you heard Dr. Olson. There's some evidence that before the flood that the atmospheric pressure was so different that it would have perhaps allowed larger creatures to fly. Mm -hmm. Yes? <clears throat> There, there are a lot of writings that declare that it breathed out of the flame. And it's not just the Bible. There are a lot of the records that say that. So all I know is that there are animals that do. And as you look at some of the nasal cavities, we simply can't tell from the, the fossilized remains. You have another question to ask. The question is why when they flew didn't they suffocate because they were but they I don't think they flew that high. They mostly lived in caves in the mountains, the ones that flew, and they would fly out. So they didn't always come out of the clouds. Sometimes when we see the movies, we show up way out, like if you watch the Hobbit movies and Slaw, which is a Polish dragon. Sometimes. Yes, sir. And you're thinking about that they were, there was a time when they were very, much more prevalent, and then what has happened, these sightings seem to be uh, extraordinary, I mean, uh, not the exception rather than the rule. I mean, it doesn't seem like there's hundreds of sightings in a certain area, or well, maybe some hundreds, but they're more, they're more spectacular sightings. So do you think that they just gradually have died out? I mean, what is your explanation for that? What is my explanation for why they seem to die out? Why we don't see them very, very no, we hardly see any now. Why we hardly see anything anymore? I think they got tired of dragging this thing out. I think when you read some of the historical accounts, it becomes obvious, there, there's a couple issues I think that are going on. When we have longer longevity with different atmospheres in the earth and so forth, people and creatures did live long. I mean, there's ample evidence for that. And as we mentioned, reptiles continue to grow as long as they live. Now, once that's been contaminated, they don't live as long, so they're not going to grow to be quite as big, point number one. Point number two, as they're growing up and they're small, they're terrorizing people. Not, not necessarily eating people that we talk about all the time, but they were eating livestock, the farmer's livelihood, and the farmers killed them. To the point where in Europe you actually see that there was reporting since 16, 1700 of dragons, and they were always with the farmers, and the farmers killed them. You typically don't find dragons. When I was mentioning the whales, that was a rare account when you saw them in many of them. Usually they were by themselves, one or two. They were kind of lone creatures. You didn't find like a den of dragons, if you will. So I think that that is really a very plausible one, which also explains why when we do find the bigger ones, they're in less popular areas were people around to kill them off too early. I had a question back here. Yes. Do you have an opinion on the Inca burial stones? I, I think the Inca burial stones are extremely difficult for scientists to explain. The, the issue with those stones in Peru are that no matter what the people say about what they were forged, is however you look at them, they were drawn before we knew about the dinosaurs. Even if they don't go back thousands of years ago, they go back hundreds of years ago. How could they know to draw a dragon with a type of dinosaur with the type of specificity that we know today? Like 
the Stegosaurus on, uh, uh, on Angor Wild. How would they know to do that unless they actually saw them? The skeletal remains, the fossils, don't show those things. So some scientists say, well, they found these big bones and they made them up to be these dinosaurs. But that doesn't account for the descriptions because that soft tissue that we're talking about doesn't remain. So I think ecostones are something that somebody really saw. Now, they may have proliferated those with all the different burial stones that they had, just like the statues in Mexico. Those, those were made that look awful, an awful lot like dinosaurs we know today. And they cannot be explained away as being frauds, simply because their dating is still too early to have been fraudulent manufactured. And when they tried to do that, by the way, they tried to have people come up and do it. They couldn't. They had somebody that apparently they had, had volunteered to say, oh, I, I made this. So some, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce. In any event, I said, okay, show me. They couldn't do it. Yes? They have uh, baby dragons, yes, they have papa dragons and mama dragons. And they laid eggs. I know they're dinosaur egg clutches that they found fossilized, but these reports that you find that never is a dinosaur family or a dragon family, it's always all alone. With the eggs that they find? Some, some did, some produced so, one. But, uh, the question is, is that these different sightings always seem to be uh, singles. There's never a mama and a papa kind of thing. That's generally true. Uh, there's never usually a lot of sightings of a lot of them. That's, as I just explained, that, that's typically not the case. You usually have a sighting of, of just one. And sometimes they'll show up in an area and then disappear for 100 years, and then someone will sight it again. Yes? Are there any ancient cultures that do not have great origins? None that I could find at all. None. And I believe there's something like 300 and some ancient cultures. It's some sort of a serpentine dragon. It may not be the, the two-foot fire-breathing winged dragon, but some sort of a serpent monster if you know, creature. One more question. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm old, I can't hear very well. What's the smallest full-grown dragon that you guys know of? The smallest full-grown dragon that we know of? Wow, that's a great question. You know, I, I would have to say it's the Lindbergh in Germany. There's another special name for it, but, there, but in my research I found that, as I mentioned, they called dragons worms, because a lot of them were like worms or snakes. And some of them, when they showed the picture, they would come out of the earth. I don't know that they were full grown, but some of those were only like 18 inches long. But they fit into the general classification. Well, I'm out of time. If somebody wants to discuss things a little bit more, I'll stick down here. Again, thank you very much.